Hmm. What is the ultimate cell activator? Stay tuned. By the end of this video, I'll have an answer for you. Hello and welcome to Chase Fluid Art. My name is Steve Chase. I'm a practicing artist and proponent of abstract cellism. First, I want to thank you for the kind response to my previous video. So nice of you to watch it, and I do appreciate it. My hope was to make it useful not only for folks just starting out, but also for those that might be struggling a little bit with this unique form of art. I wanted to convey a broad overview of my process in the first video. So in this episode, I'll narrow things down a bit and concentrate on ingredients and why I think it's so important to understand the cause and effect they have on this style of painting. Included will be some pictures, videos, with different recipes for a top layer mix. I know it's lengthy, but I have a lot to say on this subject that's contrary to what I'm seeing as standard procedure. I hope you'll find that it's time well spent to see a very different point of view. I suspect that for the uninitiated artist, the very unusual look of a painting containing cells has them wondering if it might be produced by some kind of chemical reaction from the ingredients. And that thought is piqued the first time they witness the process and see the cells seemingly explode from the canvas. I clearly remember that it was my initial reaction. And then it was reinforced by the prevailing view at that time that a chemical reaction from silicone oil was responsible for producing the cells. I didn't question it, but I learned through experience that looks and assumptions can be deceiving. So I want to begin this discussion with a big pet peeve of mine that deals specifically with the enhancers such as silicon oil and Floetrol. I absolutely cringe now when I'm asked, what do you use as a CA or a cell activator? That notion is so ingrained and widespread that it seems to be all that matters. But I have to tell you that I really don't like that concept or even the mindset behind that question. It predisposes and perpetuates the idea that our style of art is dependent on so-called secret formulas and ingredients that rely on chemical reactions to create cells in a painting. That makes it seem like junior science and child's play to the critics and not worthy of being considered art. Unfortunately, that negativity is too widespread and it affects value. The irony is that I believe the chemical reaction premise is greatly overblown and way out of whack. Perhaps my research and skills are not up to speed, but I just cannot find any specific evidence that chemical reactions create cells from an acrylic paint mix. There's certainly a lot of assumptions and speculation, but I can't find any convincing proof. Take silicon oil, for example. It's the artificial cell maker that started this chemical reaction mindset. It's used mostly in a pouring style of technique. Given a balanced pouring mix and a film thin to the right depth, Silicon oil produces cells because unlike any other type of ingredient, it's a unique foreign body that does not blend or coalesce with water-based acrylic paint. That old adage applies here. Oil and water don't mix. So my question is, if they can't combine, how could there possibly be a chemical reaction taking place between them? There isn't. So why then does the silicon make cells? When it's added to the bottom layers of an acrylic paint mix, the silicon will act independently. And because it's lighter in density than the paint, it will rise toward the surface because it's seeking balance or parity, kind of like bubbles rising to the top of a soda. Ideally, as it reaches the surface, it has pushed some of the different colors of paint up with it 
in the form of cells. This is a very simplified explanation, but it's on point because it's actually a very straightforward process and shows that in reality, it's physics that's producing the cells and not a chemical reaction at all. I believe that the first artist to figure this out knew exactly what they were doing. It was extremely creative thinking. But somehow, as this idea went through the rumor mill, it ended up being explained away as a chemical reaction. And that's very understandable because it looks like that's what's transpiring right in front of your eyes. Unfortunately, that inaccurate speculation took hold and became the consensus view and a terrible precedent. It's so entrenched now that it's taken for granted and become standard practice to link chemical reactions with cell production for this style of art. And that can cause a lot of confusion and frustration. Unless it's clearly understood exactly why the cells are being formed, it becomes a matter of relying on hearsay and blind luck for the artist. And too many times that results in total frustration after you've randomly added nebulous chemicals to the paint and it only produces a pile of mush on the canvas with no cells in sight. So what about a CA or cell activator used in a swiping or an air assisted technique? I think it's very clear that to the average person, the term cell activator suggests that the ingredients in a product like Australian Floetrol, for example, will cause cells to form. Why else would so many people ask, what do you use as a cell activator? And why is there such a clamor for the Australian Floetrol? So far, I've only seen conjecture that it's actually true. Perhaps a bona fide chemist will step forward and explain this phenomenon scientifically. But it looks more like alchemy to me. I'm not buying it, and I think it's an awfully misleading term. I believe there's a more realistic explanation for cells to form with these techniques by understanding fluid dynamics. And there's proven scientific evidence that demonstrates it. According to the Rayleigh-Taylor instability theory, cells are formed as a result of a physical reaction with the different densities of the pigments in the paint itself. That's a huge difference. And unfortunately, that fact is largely ignored with all this misguided focus being placed on so-called cell activators. I put my faith in Rayleigh Taylor. My theories and methods are based on it. I absolutely believe that physical pigment manipulation through gravity or external force, is the key to producing cells. And I don't think anyone should rely on a hope and a prayer that chemicals in the flow trawl will perform magic and automatically do the job for them. As a matter of fact, when I think in chemical terms, it's not about creating cells. It's usually because I see potential roadblocks that prevent them from forming. And that leads me to take a very defensive position with regards to the ingredients. So, before I get into an extensive discussion on Floetrol and alternatives for a top layer mix, I need to start at the beginning and give a brief outline of the process to explain the stages involved with this technique. It's necessary because I'll be referring to different stages at different times in this video. Some of it is redundant from my first video, but as ongoing experimentation takes place, minor changes have been made in thought, procedure, and materials. I think it's important to review the process as I would practice it today so that you can understand where I'm coming from with regards to producing cells. The technique that I use the most these days utilizes the Rayleigh-Taylor instability theory as a basis, but instead of relying on its gravity alone process to produce cells, I force the issue 
and assist the top layer of paint to thin and spread out and sink down by using controlled pressure. I think of it as the forced Rayleigh-Taylor technique, and I organized it into four stages. The ingredients in the main mix are paint, medium, tar gel, and a thinner, all blended to a spot-on consistency in stage one. Stage two is an entirely different mix that will be used as a top layer of paint in a puddle pour. It consists of paint and a thinner mixed to a low viscosity consistency. It's designed to assist stage three. This is where the most important step of all comes into play. The type and amount of physical force applied to the top layer mix will cause the film to thin and the cells to form and determine where and how they will begin their journey. This is absolutely crucial and the key to the entire process because if it's not executed properly, everything falls apart. Air pressure is my preferred method of force and the basis for this video. Stage four involves spinning or tilting the canvas to thin the film, enlarge the cells, and ultimately cover the canvas. So that's the simple explanation of what's involved in this technique. Since I spent more time on stages three and four in the last video, I want to give more detail about stages one and two that deals with ingredients in this one. So let's see why they are so important to the procedure. Stage one, the main mix. Obviously a crucial factor in the process is producing the main pouring mix. It's the foundation. Everything else depends on it. It needs to be uncomplicated with simple ingredients and the proper consistency for your particular style. So why is it so important? Because this is where the pigments reside and in this technique, that's where the cells are born. With that fact in mind, the paint itself stands alone as the main and by far the most important ingredient in the entire operation. It is always my central figure of concern. And I think all of the other ingredients should be as benign as possible and play a very specific but secondary role. The bottom line is that I want to create an unencumbered environment so that the pigments can freely perform and create cells. Since the paint is the key, I want it heavily loaded with pigment and with minimal fillers that might interfere with the process. Golden Fluid Acrylics fits that description for me, and it's the paint that I use the most. And no, they aren't paying me to say that. And yes, it's expensive, but for me, this is no place to cut corners because this is the very heart of the process, and I think it makes a huge difference in execution and final outcome. My ratio is 10% paint to medium. One side note here, it's important to mix the other components of the medium up in advance. The paint is the very last ingredient added. The medium. This is the neutral suspension agent for the pigments that allows them the freedom to interact and the paint to flow. What I'm looking for is simplicity and elasticity, an uncomplicated environment for the pigments and stretchable so that it will hold everything together during the initial blow and then the spinning or tilting process. Presently, I'm using an untinted deep base house paint, Bear number 3453, which is in essence the medium used for commercial house paint. It's much thicker, less complex, pigment friendly, and more elastic than artist mediums by design. I've had success with other brands, but this one stands out as the best one for me. Now, it's one thing to create an environment for cells to form. 
It's another thing to keep them intact with all the movement taking place with this process. So I've been experimenting with a product from Golden named Tar Gel. It's a medium designed to give paint more stretch than consistency alone provides. Whether or not it produces a significant amount of stretch effect, I can't say. There are just too many variables. But I have a very strong impression that it does help stability by the results I'm seeing. It's not an absolute requirement, but since it's showing very positive results with no signs of interference, I think it's a great addition to the mix. The thinner. I mostly use high gloss polycrylic instead of something like Floetrol or water to thin the medium to consistency. It's a little risky because of its complexity but since it's a small amount and being incorporated and diluted within the medium independently, I'm not seeing any evidence that it's overpowering the pigments. I've used it a lot over the years with different styles of paintings because it's an effective thinner and will increase gloss. Floetrol, on the other hand, shows signs of interference and it tends to dull things down. And using water alone as a thinner isn't really a consideration because I try to only use it when I want to dilute or weaken an ingredient. The ratio for the mix is three parts bare, one part polyacrylic, and 0.4 parts tar gel. The consistency I like for the main mix is on the thicker side of neutral to counteract and absorb the watery consistency of the mix coming up in stage two. I keep in mind the obvious. If the mix is too thin, cells will rapidly distort and disappear. If the mix is too thick, the cells will struggle to surface. I like this medium so much that I'm using it as my base coat now. Since it's the same medium as the colors use, I believe it adds more stability to the process and severely limits crazing. And as the painting sets up and dries, there's more continuity. I'm also seeing a noticeable improvement with swiping. Now we get to stage two, the top layer mix. It's absolutely not some new or modern revelation. Names for it may change, but its effects have been studied, understood, and used in cell type paintings since at least the 1930s, when artist David Alfaro Sequeiros was putting it into practice. It contains paint and a low viscosity thinner, and would seem to be the simplest of all stages. But for me, it was the hardest thing to navigate and flesh out. It works on the same principle whether it's swiping or a puddle pour with air pressure or even covering an entire canvas and using gravity as a force. I've always heard of it as simply being called the top layer mix, but these days it's being widely promoted as the CA or cell activator as a sales tool for a commercial enterprise. As I said before, I cringe at that term because the way it's being bandied about on the internet is leading a lot of people to believe that Australian Floetrol is the holy grail and responsible for cell production. Nope. I think that's a very misleading assumption and unfortunately causing too many people undue confusion, frustration, and expense. In this type of technique, it's force applied from the top layer mix to the pigments in the main mix that activates the cells. And it's not dependent on a secondary magical ingredient like Australian Floetrol is purported to be. Given all the hype, it might interest you to know that the top layer mix that I'm using right now in this demonstration is simply paint thinned with water with no other ingredients at all. I would never use or recommend using only water as a thinner 
for an actual painting, but it does demonstrate very clearly how the cells are actually formed with this technique. Now, having said that, don't get me wrong. I like Floetrol. I've used it, but it's absolutely not the cell activator. So if it's not the cell activator, what does Australian Floetrol do in this context? First of all, it's simply a paint conditioner and more stable with paint than just water would be when it was used as a thinner. Its composition does level the paint and smooths out its flow. So it enhances the, or conditions the paint. But what really makes Australian Floetrol stand out for this process is its chemical simplicity and low viscosity. So here's the gist of the top layer mix, in my opinion. It's a vehicle that contains paint with dense pigments, and it needs to be thin to a low viscosity, so it'll make it easier to spread out and above all, sink through the paint below it. As I mentioned before, the stage three, physical force and weight of the top layer mix being pushed down and sinking is the cell activator and it's irrespective of the ingredients used to thin the paint. And here's why. Downward force applied to the pigments in the paint itself causes them to counteract and rise up to the surface to get to an equilibrium. And that is what forms the cells. In other words, it's the Rayleigh-Taylor instability theory being forced into action. This is a good illustration of why it's so important to clearly understand cause and effect and why I think it's terrible and downright detrimental to use the term CA or cell activator as it's currently used. And why? Because it gives people a misleading impression and a false hope. It insinuates that it's the ingredients or chemicals in the flow trawl that activate cells to form, and that's clearly not the case. And here's an example of why that term is so detrimental. Let's suppose a new artist with limited experience is trying out various techniques and would like to use Australian Floetrol because they've heard that it's the cell activator. Damage has already been done because now it's been instilled in their thinking that chemicals will produce the cells for them. Now let's also suppose that for whatever reason, Australian Floetrol is not available to this individual. The assumption is that now they must find a cell-producing ingredient as a substitute for the Floetrol. After a few attempts and failures, it gets very frustrating. So now it's time to go all in and blindly throw all sorts of bizarre ingredients into the mix in hopes of creating a chemical reaction. That will usually do more harm than good because what they add will have a real potential of interfering with the pigments or make other elements of the paint go wildly berserk and in the end trash up the painting. It's going to be a wild goose chase ending in a train wreck that was totally unnecessary because it's based on faulty assumptions about the flow trawl and chemical reactions in the first place. Just to be very clear, I believe that proper ingredients are absolutely the foundation and essential. But whether it's passive or aggressive, the artist is producing the cells because of physical actions and not because some nebulous chemical concoction will do the job for them. So to sum it up, the top layer mix does not create cells chemically. Its real purpose is to help put downward pressure on the pigments in the main mix to initiate a counteraction from them. And in its wake, leave a fortified outline of the cells as it sinks to the bottom. As for Australian Floetrol, it just happens to be a very good thinner for the top layer paint because its chemical composition is so benign and simple that it isn't interfering with the pigments in any negative way and its consistency is very good right out of the bottle 
but I'm confident that my main mix is correctly set up to produce cells, and since I know what causes them to form, I can use that information as a solid basis to experiment with different ingredients to see what works best for the stage two top layer mix. It has nothing to do with chemically creating cells. The focus is to produce a dense paint mix that meets at least three requirements. First, it has to have the proper consistency. Second, it won't interfere or overwhelm the pigments doing their job. And third, hold its integrity under pressure. I want utility, not miracles. So the possibilities expand for a variety of top layer mixes. The paint being used is by far the most important ingredient. And why? Because it contains color, fillers, and the weight of the pigments. It's doing the principal job. The main role of the thinner is to get the paint to the right consistency. If it can add elements to help the procedure without interference, all the better. Now, as far as the paint goes, fluid acrylics would seem to be a good fit, but unfortunately, they don't have enough body because they have a limited amount of fillers. And I want fillers in this stage to lag behind and help fortify the outlines of the cells. Heavy body acrylics are too thick and take way too much thinner to get the right consistency. So I want a mid-range consistency paint like soft body acrylics. They have enough body and take less thinner. I look for a top of the line student grade paint because they have a good balance of pigments and fillers. There's one more major consideration. Different brands and types of paint and even colors of the same brand don't always play well together. They must be evaluated and tested individually with the main mix because it's crucial that the paint in this stage does not overwhelm the paint in the main mix. The good news is that it's the last ingredient that needs testing. The bad news is that I've found very few that totally fulfill the requirements. So it takes a lot of trial and error to find the right one. I'm presently using Lucas Acryl Black and some of the Amsterdam student acrylics. The thinner. Its main job is to get the paint to the proper consistency. I would love to use just water alone because it's so benign, but it's not a good choice because it dilutes the paint too much and makes it weaker. And it has zero body to help hold the outline of the cells together. As you can see with these photos of the earlier demonstration. So the problem becomes finding a thinner with more body than water. It should be designed for use with acrylic paint and it should fortify and it should not over dilute and at the same time not interfere with the pigments. In that regard, I believe that unnecessary chemicals in a thinner's formula is the biggest potential problem because they can get in the way and negatively affect the pigments and actually prevent cells from forming. It's time to play defense and protect the pigments. So the search begins with the least complex product possible and paint additives and conditioners are a good place to start. Here are a few possibilities. Australian Floetrol. It is by far the least complex conditioner I have seen. And because of that, it's a very good thinner. It's effective for a swiping technique and for using small size canvases and tiles in an air technique. However, I believe it's completely misunderstood. It's not because it might contain some nebulous cell producing chemical. It's just the opposite. It's unnecessary chemicals that are not included in the Australian flow trial that makes it a good thinner. I see nothing in its makeup that interferes with the pigments at all. I think it's a great unaltered choice because out of all the other products I've tried, it's so simple and benign that it doesn't need to be modified to do the job. However, it has a couple of negatives. 
Since it contains up to 90% water, there's not quite enough body in its makeup to hold the integrity of the cell lines with larger paintings using an air pressure technique. And unfortunately, cost and availability are a huge negative consideration. And it's unlikely that it will be made more readily available at a reasonable price anywhere but Australia. If you live in Australia, that's great. The paint gods have smiled on you. But I phased it out because I live in America and the cost is just way too outrageous to justify any benefit. And the risk and inconvenience of shipping gallon jugs from Australia isn't worth worrying about when I can get local products in a matter of days. Now, if you're willing to spend a little time to get the other thinners up to speed, there are other avenues. American Floatron. I believe that it's more complex and contains less water than its Australian cousin, so it's not as effective straight out of the bottle. It's not that it's necessarily thick, it's just that it's on the borderline of being gummy. It clogs up even in its original container. And it's also not because it's missing a so-called magic cell-making chemical, it's because it contains unnecessary chemicals. And that is what's making it gum up and cause interference with the pigments. My solution was to dilute it with water to make it less gummy and at the same time weaken it to make the chemicals less invasive. I had to thin it a lot to make it benign. And it works okay for practice and color testing, but for an actual painting, I'm not wild about using it as a primary thinner because it's lacking body. However, I really like using watered down Floetrol as a substitute for just using water alone to thin other products. The mix is eight parts water to five parts Floetrol if it's going to be used as a secondary thinner. Next up is Otrol. Same situation as American Floetrol. I would only use it as a secondary thinner like the watered down American Floetrol and using the same formulas. Out of dozens of products that I have tested for thinners, two of them are the biggest surprise and stand out. Liquitex pouring medium. Since it's an artist medium and more complex than other things I tried, I was absolutely shocked that it worked at all, but I could see that there were possibilities. Even though there was obvious interference with the pigments, I could tell that it wasn't impossibly overwhelming. It appears to really latch on to the paint, and as a consequence, when the pressure is applied, the unmodified mix leaves pockets of microcells. But since it has more substance than a lot of other mediums, I felt there was room to dilute it with the watered-down flow trawl to weaken it and alter its grip on the pigments and still retain some of its positive qualities. That made a huge difference and made it a workable thinner. It has body and limited effect on the pigments and it has a big bonus. Since it's an artist medium, it's essentially untinted paint and makes this mix mostly paint, which is exactly what I would want. And this mix sinks at a little slower rate than the flow trawls, which is good for leaving more potential for reinforcing the sail lines. I really like it a lot. It ranks number two on my list. My formula is to mix 10 parts Liquitex pouring medium with four parts of the watered down flow trawl to create the thinner. Then use 10 parts of this thinner to seven parts Lucas black paint. The next surprise was golden tar gel. Again, it's a complex medium designed to allow paint to stretch, which sounds absolutely ideal on the face of it. However, it's very syrupy and takes a lot of watered down flow trawl to get it to a workable thinner consistency. So it took a lot of experimentation to get it up to speed. 
Keep in mind that the main goal here is to produce a thinner. If it happens to add more stability and stretch after it's been thinned this much, it would simply be a bonus. I can't absolutely say for sure, but I believe it does because this combination worked like a champion. It didn't affect the pigments and the cell lines are more stable than anything else I've tried. Here's the mix. I use four parts golden tar gel with 10 parts of the watered down flow troll to create the thinner. Then eight parts of this thinner with three parts Lucas black paint. The bottom line, since I like to use a variety of canvas sizes to create paintings, I prefer the golden tar gel mix in conjunction with the Lucas acryl black paint because I think it's more substantial than other mixes. And if the potential is there to help with stretching, it's a bonus and an advantage. The bottom line is that it works great as a top layer mix regardless. Yes, the tar gel is a bit pricey, but still considerably less than the Australian Floetrol. And it's widely available. Until something better comes along, this is my go-to mix. That's it. Time's run out for this video. Time to put this baby to bed and I need a nap. In conclusion, this type of Rayleigh Taylor painting is a complex endeavor. And anyone who thinks it's child's play is just arrogantly ignorant in my book. It's a balancing act between stages where everything has to line up just right to get favorable results. When I first started out, I was led to believe that a chemical reaction was the answer to the cell puzzle. Boy, was that wrong. And I eventually realized that relying on things like silicon oil to shortcut the procedure was actually a roadblock to a much cleaner and more creative process. I finally understood that the paint itself was the real magic ingredient. So the focus became what's the simplest and best way to allow it the freedom to do its job. One more thing needs to be heavily stressed. While creating superior mixes is absolutely vital, at the end of the day, they can only provide potential. The formulas that I use are designed for my particular use of controlled air. They're very specific as to materials, proportions, and consistency. There's no way to know if they'll work for you until they're tried out by you. It may take some tweaking to fit your particular style of force, but I have every confidence that they will work for you also. If nothing else, I hope what's taken away from this video is that thinking in terms of chemical magic, producing cells in a painting for you is the wrong approach. This is a physical discipline. Applying the pressure to the mix is the absolute key and crucial for success. Whether it's swiping or using air, it takes practice and skill to apply the right amount of force and finesse to create this type of painting. But isn't that the point of becoming an artist? Now, for the answer to the question that started this video, what is the ultimate cell activator? There's only one answer, you are. Thank you so much for watching. I look forward to your questions and comments. And until next time, I'll sign off. Abstract Cellism is the ultimate expression of abstract art. It's a balancing act between stages where everything... <laughs> If you only knew how many times I screwed this up, it ain't easy. It's a balancing, 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 balancing act. It's a producer, a producer, a producer, a producer. Jesus. Uh, it's to get the paint to a yeah, yeah. Oh. <sighs> it's not available to this in, 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 in individual. <laughs> God. Uh.
Oh, I wish my tongue and my brain worked better together, but unfortunately they don't. Boy, was that wrong. And it sure was wrong. It's always been wrong. And one answer, you are. You are. One day I'll learn how to point. So I did not tell you that it was the first video. So perhaps I need to start over. Oh boy. I really look forward to it. They have on the entire process. No, won't do. Start over. Narrow things down a bit and concentrate on ingredients. And why? Ingredients. Yeah, let's concentrate on ingredients.